Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Investing from A to Z podcast. I'm your host, Steph Bodrini. This podcast is for everyone who wants to learn about investing in commercial properties. We get the best people in the industry to give you straightforward and practical advice that you can actually use in your investing. In today's episode, we are going to be learning a ton in the self-storage space. Make sure to get your notes taking app out and really focus. We're learning what are some value add methods for self-storage. How can you differentiate your facility from other facilities in your area and how and if you should hire a property manager for your facility. We are talking with Claire Hoover. He has over 20 years of experience in the self-storage space. His current focus is building commercial real estate investment and management companies. He serves on the board of directors for the Pennsylvania Self-Storage Association and is highly experienced in this asset class as well as mobile home parks, car washes, laundromats, and residential housing. Here we go. Claire, thank you so much for joining us today. I am so, so, so excited to have you here because I heard incredible things about you and uh, we finally got a chance to connect. First, why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Sure. My name is uh, Claire Hoover. By the way, it's great to be here. I'm glad we got to connect as well. My name is Claire Hoover. I live in uh, South Central Pennsylvania, actually Lancaster, Pennsylvania, for those of you who know that area. I've uh, been married 32 years, uh, two sons and two daughter-in-laws, and happy to announce our first grandchild on the way. Congratulations. Uh, also, yeah, thank you. I, I think we're excited about it. I'm told it's going to change my life, and I happen to like my life, but uh, it's a great <laughs> to do it. Uh, and we share our house with two Shih Tzu dogs who actually run the place. Uh, hobbies, I like anything with horsepower, uh, fast motorcycles, cars, boats, trucks, uh, anything that gives me a little adrenaline rush and uh, other hobbies, um, a lot of scuba diving with my sons. We are our skiers, surfers, uh, sailors. So uh, try to get out there and enjoy as much of life as we can. Good for you, Claire. I love this intro. Uh, so why don't we jump into what is the state of the self-storage industry today? So uh, self-storage industry, I believe, is one of the hottest uh, asset classes out there right now. Uh, a lot of different reasons for it. Um, I think the, the most recent that we can point to, uh, I've watched self-storage industry go through two very challenging times, 07 and 08 recession. And then whatever just happened here in 2020, I don't even know what to call it. It might have been <laughs> the shortest depression we ever had. Uh, however, uh, in that asset class, self-storage had the least amount of downturn and the fastest recovery of almost every asset class. And uh, so it's passed two big tests for me. And uh, it's an incredibly, incredibly hot asset class right now. Uh, a lot of uh, dollars chasing very few properties and a lot of people wanting to get in because of the performance. Yep. And the cap rates are very compressed in self-storage. How do you go about purchasing them nowadays? Um, you, uh, you do what everybody's had to do in tight times and in, uh, in every part of real estate. Uh, you end up looking at more properties and being on less. And um, I would say a year ago, for every 20 properties we looked at, we would put an offer on one. I'm guessing right now it's closer to 100 properties we look at before we find one that we think is even fairly valued. So it's a challenging time. I think patience is part of it. Uh, but also we want to keep growing. So we keep uh, keep sorting through every haystack we can find, uh, trying to find some bargain buys. I'm glad I'm not alone there talking with a super <laughs> expert. Let's jump into what are some value add methods for self-storage facilities since you have so much experience there. I, I just thought of something I'd love to ask, add to your last question. I heard the best real estate joke I think I've ever heard. Uh, there was a real estate agent just got done showing a young couple a house and he looked at them and said, if you'd like to see something in a higher price bracket, I can show you this one again tomorrow. <laughs> that one, I, I love that. It's kind of scary, but that's the truth. And uh, uh, a year ago, uh, we were not seeing that in self-storage. Today, we're actually seeing multiple offers within hours at times, a lot of them cash only offers. 
and a lot of them above asking price. So all of that pressure we see on the residential market, uh, we're seeing uh, entering the commercial market. It's really crazy. It is. It's everywhere. It's really insane. Industrial as well. So I wasn't avoiding your question on value add, but I love that joke. I don't know why that one makes me laugh. Uh, it's a so good one. Value add, um, probably the biggest opportunity we see. We look for three things when we buy a property. We like to see, uh, we call it the triple play. We like to see upside on rate management. We like to see upside on occupancy. And we like to see upside on expansion opportunities. We will settle for two out of three. Uh, but we rarely would bite on something that doesn't at least have two of those opportunities available. So the biggest mistake we probably see today uh, would be under managing rate management. There are so many opportunities there. You will actually find people in self storage who brag about 100% occupancy, and they'll brag about the fact that they're the lowest priced option in their market. Uh, you right. just think through, think through the math on what I just said and what they're laying on the table. Uh, I love meeting people like that. And I love making an offer on their property. A lot of upside on rate management. Uh, another one a lot of people are missing are admin fees. It's become customary in our markets, at least, uh, to be charging admin fees. It covers some of your costs to put a client in, and it's, it's um, accepted by the market. So, again, you're just letting money on the table. and. You mentioned cap rates. Uh, when you start talking about a couple thousand dollars a year or even tens of thousands in admin fees, uh, you take that at a five or even a four percent cap in some markets, you're talking about some serious cash being left on the table by not maximizing that. Sure. Uh, the other up to, uh, two, other two upsides I mentioned already were occupancy. If you're low occupancy, I would invest in marketing. Uh, you've got to fill that facility up. That's dead dollars on the table. The last one, uh, a lot of people say is not available to them, but it often is, and that's expansion capability. So if you're on a, a five-acre parcel and you've got it maxed out, you're not thinking outside the box. There's got to be some land within a mile or two of you somewhere uh, that you could add more storage to, and you probably don't need to increase your labor costs. You can probably run both facilities out of one office if needed. But one other one, I'll, I'll throw tenant insurance. So when I got in the business, I've had I have 22 years in self-storage uh, experience. And uh, when I got in the business, uh, I would say rule of thumb was about 80% of homeowners policies or apartment rental policies would cover a self-storage unit. Uh, today, that's at least reversed in some, some markets, almost non-existent. Insurance companies have gotten very clever about uh, writing out certain pieces. So uh, today, if you're not selling tenant insurance, there's a good chance your tenants aren't covered. And it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when you're going to have an issue, whether it be a fire, a flood, or wind damage. Something's going to hurt your tenants' belongings. And there's no insurance policy that you can buy that covers their, your tenants' belongings. It has to be a tenant insurance policy, and there's profit when you sell that to your tenants. If you're not doing that one, you're probably one of the few in the market that aren't. You're letting money on the table, and you're also putting your business at financial risk uh, during any type of disaster. Do you have a good insurance company that you recommend for that? Um, I, I, you know what? I deal with three of them, so I'd rather not give out one name because they're all very good in different markets. So I would just tell you, do your research. Ask around very quickly if you don't know who you would want to get. Uh, you can call any of your competitors and pose as a tenant and ask them who they use for insurance. So you'll get sure. the information pretty easily. So we also have a ton of self-storage facilities popping up in a lot of markets. How do you differentiate yourself from other facilities in order to increase your occupancy? That's a great question. Um, it can be different in different markets. Um, I would say automation today is probably... The best way to differentiate yourself, somebody told me recently, I thought this was pretty funny. If you're trying to buy self-storage facilities, whatever effort it takes, find a Yellow Pages. I think you can be Google, actually drive to a phone company today. You can probably still get them. I think they're still being published. <laughs> and I don't. Uh, and look for the largest ad in that market and buy that idiot out. Sorry to use a strong language there, but idiot's the only word you can use for anybody who's spending $1,000 or more a month on Yellow Pages or spending anything on them. So... When I say automation, I don't know what age it would be. I mean, it's been five years since I've looked at Yellow Pages, maybe longer. Uh, my sons are in their mid-20s, don't know what I'm talking about. They've never heard of the Yellow Pages. And my sons, uh, if you if they try to find a business through any traditional method, if they don't have a web presence, they write them off as non-existent. 
So differentiation, I think you've got to be one of the strongest digital marketers in your market. If you're not, you're probably alienating anyone under the age of 40, and quite a few of us over 40 are going to write you off. The automation has so many things to it. When it comes to a good, a good website, uh, one of the things they say, a good website never has a bad sales call. 24 hours a day, that thing is working for you, unlike your phone, which you probably have limited time to pick it up. So uh, digital marketing uh, differentiates just also a huge cost savings. The amount of money that I spend marketing a website versus what we used to spend on Yellow Pages. Uh, much, much more effective, much more targeted. And uh, I think it's probably one of the best ways to differentiate yourself today. Moving on to the management and actual day-to-day operations side, what are some questions we should all ask when we interview a potential property manager for our facility? So I'll answer that, but I'd like to take it back to the 30,000 foot level and challenge you whether you even want a manager. So the uh, first question, I will tell you 50% of my facilities have no manager on site. And I've, I started out as an experiment and um, it's proven, uh, we kind of watched uh, managed versus unmanaged uh, as far as on site presence. Uh, my unmanaged sites uh, for many different reasons, I go in a lot of details are outperforming my managed sites. So uh, when I do hire a manager, uh, one of the things I would take you back to, it's a, it's a business principle. And it's, uh, I don't know why, where I first heard on who to give credit. But the business principle is people do not do business with businesses. They do business with people. So mm-hmm. when you're looking at that manager you're interviewing, if you don't have a people person who you generally enjoy talking to and want to be with, you're doing your business a disservice. So I think the, the highest characteristic is they have to be uh, someone who is likable and actually get energized by being with other people. Otherwise, you're going to wear them out. People pick up on them very quickly. So true. So you can have the nicest uh, facility in the area, the best website, you name it, all the bells and whistles. But if you've got an unsmiling face behind that counter, uh, you're not doing yourself any favors. So people, people. And then the uh, the challenge to uh, anyone out there today is, do you need a manager on site? Uh, we started testing this about two years ago. Uh, we were looking to get into smaller facilities, and a small facility has a big challenge. It's not large enough to cover large fixed costs, and labor is a major fixed cost. I mean, if you're going to staff an office, uh, you're talking a minimum, I would think, of 40000 probably closer to 60000 cost to put a manager in an office. Yep. A small facility has a hard time cracking that. When I say small, I'm talking maybe 20,000 square feet or less. We looked at automation as a way to get around that. We wanted to serve smaller communities. We liked the profitability and upside of these small facilities. It was a bit of a challenge. Uh, at one point, this, this is a challenge Walmart had when they tried to get you to check your own stuff out. They put in the automated checkout lines. And you know, some people looked at it and said, you know, I'm paying the same price and doing your work for you. Just didn't like it. A lot of resistance to it. Uh, we saw some of that resistance. However, uh, the big game changer here is COVID. Uh, instead of looking lazy and not putting a manager on site, we now get to uh, market because we care about you. We offer contactless move-in. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was appeared to be a weakness became a huge marketing opportunity for us. 50% of our facilities are completely unattended and we're shifting a higher and higher percentage each year. For any of you who are trying to hire in today's market, um, unless you're in a different part of the world than I am, it is very difficult to find qualified help, people that want to actually want to work. And so automation, again, has been a godsend for us. What should people know and consider before investing in self-storage? Uh, so that's a great question. Um, my belief system, it is one of the best passive income opportunities available today. And uh, the reason I use the word passive, I guess I should have started off with uh, answering your question with the uh, this part of it. And what you need to know today is this thing is much, much more complicated than it was five years ago with a lot of moving parts. Uh, five years ago, if you would ask me the same question, I would have told you you could probably get by with a Yellow Pages ad and an answering machine. And I would say maybe 50 percent of the facilities uh, there, there are uh, affectionately called mom and pop shops. Typically, it was a mom and pop, often a retired couple that were running a small self-storage facility. And uh, that's exactly how they did it. Yellow Pages, uh, if you call, they might answer. But more likely, you get an answer machine. They would return the call maybe after their jobs or whenever it's convenient. Do you have any idea what happens today when a millennial gets an answering machine? 
Oh, of course. <laughs> they will never, ever think about you again. Next. I don't know what the percentage of hangups are, but I guarantee it's going to be close to 100%. So uh, yeah. here, the reality is uh, it takes a lot more uh, uh, bells and whistles today and, and a lot more complex pieces uh, to be able to serve every segment of the market. So we've identified five different ways that customers would possibly want to uh, interface with us. Uh, I would start out with a very traditional method where they want to walk into an office and see a body and talk to you. And then uh, it ratchets through a couple of other options right down to uh, completely automated where they will, on their smartphone want to be able to run a unit without ever talking to anyone. And we have made uh, efforts to be effective in all areas, but we're moving further and further away from that first one because it's too expensive of a customer uh, to have that body sitting there. So that being said, uh, about getting involved in self-storage, um, great passive investment because there's really good third-party options available to manage it for you. If you want to get in today, I think you've got two big decisions to make, and I would steer you to option B. Option A is go all in. Develop a team like I have. I have, uh, we have close to 30 people working with us now doing management and all of the, uh, take care of all the websites, all the SEO work, uh, all the marketing. Or option B, just focus on acquisition and turn all those headaches over to someone else. You're going to pay somewhere uh, six, eight, maybe 9% of gross will go to some third party management. Here's what I can tell you, unless you are amazing and you're, you can build a team faster than I did, that third-party management is going to do better than you did. And whatever they're charging you, you most likely will get it back through increased revenue. They're going to be that much better at what they do. So uh, very complex business, but huge opportunities to be a passive investor. Just go out and acquire them, turn it over to third-party management, and then watch the checks start rolling in. And that is something that you recently started doing, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we have. So uh, I actually took a look at uh, turning my my facilities over to third party management and came very close to doing that. Uh, it's kind of a strange reason I didn't do it. I have two sons wanting to come into the business and um, I wanted them to wake up every morning completely overwhelmed uh, with a lot of work to do uh, to build character. And yep. uh, this generation, uh, we call them, often call them the entitled generation. I didn't want my sons to be like that. So we uh, intentionally chose, chose the difficult path. Uh, we decided to manage our own things, and I'm glad we did. We have a lot of fun doing it. We're very good at it. At one point, uh, some friends started getting involved in self-storage, and uh, this is exactly what I was talking about before. Their facilities were too small to attract the larger third-party management companies, and uh, we decided to take a stab at it. And it is very difficult on a smaller company uh, to make it cost effective, but we've perfected our model, especially by using automation. And so that's how we got into it. It started about two years ago, and um, we are getting a lot of interest in our third-party management. We've uh, had a pretty good track record with improving our properties, and we really enjoy that part of it. So it's been a, a definitely a growth part of what we do. Fantastic. Clara, this was so amazing. Is there anything else that you think is important for our audience to know? Uh, keep on renting units. It makes me happy. It's going to make you feel good. If you have one unit rented today, I'd rent two. You'll feel twice as good. <laughs> Any tips for renting units that quickly? Oh, man. For rent-ups, uh, <laughs> I think... Uh, you got what I see, a mistake I see um, is people, maybe if you're at 60 percent occupancy, if you own a facility, mistake I make is I see people making and it's simple math. An empty unit is zero dollars. Um, I would consider some extreme discounting and I've discounted rent, rental units up to 75 percent. We typically put a time frame on it. But if you do the math on it, if I discount a unit 75 percent for three months, um, versus letting it sit empty and I'm trying to get a full rate later on. The math is pretty simple. Uh, you're better off doing deep discounting and getting that unit built up and creating a, a customer that over time you can get back to a normal rate. Such wonderful information, great tips, Claire, incredible. Thank you so much for making the time to share all of your knowledge with, a lot of your knowledge with our audience. How can our listeners get in touch with you? Sure. Uh, you can reach me uh, directly at my email. It's Claire Hoover, C-L-A-I-R-H-O-O-B-E-R -O -O -E at Comcast.net. Or uh, just jump on our website, freedomstoragemanagement.com. Uh, you get to take a look at our um, 
our company from a deeper standpoint. We also have information on there on our third-party management services. Claire, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Been an honor. I enjoyed it. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter on our website, montecarlorei.com. And I would love to thank one of our latest reviewers, T. Dixon 508. Great podcast. I highly recommend making this podcast a part of your routine, even if you are considering commercial real estate. I was thinking about investing in storage units, and the episode I listened to is extremely helpful. Thank you so much for making the time, T. Dixon. I really appreciate it and uh, how timely it is that now we are talking about self-storage again. See you next time.